uh, honor lecture, distinguished lecture today. Uh, yeah, I'm Leslie. I just joined uh, Hong Kong U uh, this week, so I'm sorry I never uh, do the I never done any moderator for Zoom meeting. So if I'm not doing very good, yeah, please forgive me. Uh, this is my first time. Okay, uh, let me introduce the speaker today. Uh, Mario Lanza, my old friend, is a faculty member now in material science engineering at King Abdullah University Science Technology, KAUST, which is also what uh, I also stayed in KAUST uh, quite a while ago in Saudi Arabia. And before KAUST, uh, Maria actually joined uh, Suzhou University as associate professor and promoted to full professor in uh, 20, uh, 2017. And Maria Lanza published a lot of paper and I think most of us have seen a paper including science, nature, electronics, neuromorphic, and so on. And uh, I would like to mention that he got a young investigator award for microelectronic engineering in uh, 2017, and young, very famous Young 1000 Talent Awards in 2015. And also he uh, was appointed as a distinguished lecturer of the ETS. So uh, this is a great honor in uh, 2019. Uh, then he's also very aggressively in uh, chairing and also uh, doing the technical committee member uh, in IEDM, IRPS, IPFA, and APS. And currently he leads a very big group in doing 2D materials and emphasis on, uh, I would say, dielectrics and the transistor and, uh, uh, and also non multi digital information storage. So, uh, Today, he's going to share with us his recent study on wafer scale integration of 2D materials in high density memristor cross bar array, uh, array for artificial neural network. I'm sure we can learn a lot from him. So, uh, uh, Mario, it's time. It's your time now. Go ahead to. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's a very great pleasure to present, uh, uh, to present uh, in this university because. It is very prestigious and also have several friends. So I think that is very, very great. So I really thank for the, your invitation. Uh, before starting, because this lecture belongs to the Distinguished Lecture Program, let me uh, start by giving a very brief introduction about the Electron Devices Society. It is a requirement for me. So the Electron Devices Society uh, is, the, uh, is the society that organizes the International Electron Device Meeting, the IDM, which is the flagship conference for electronic devices uh, in the world. And um, it also organized many other conferences. And uh, basically, uh, uh, it is a very good forum for students and for professors to try to uh, establish a new networking and meet with uh, people who can complement their studies. So I really enjoy the activities. The, the mission is to promote the career of uh, all the, its members. And uh, you have a very large team of people uh, from top universities in the world working very hard for free. And uh, we meet regularly. We make a lot of meetings. We have different committees to promote different uh, aspects of uh, electronic engineering. So I think uh, it is a very good opportunity because when you go to one of these events, you can really have access to super uh, strong people. So when I joined the, the first time, uh, I was a very young faculty, very shy, and I could pro progress and meet people. And that was really a very excellent opportunity. I really encourage people. Uh, for the students, the, uh, there are many uh, chapters uh, for different regions, and the student registration is is very cheap and there is also a kind of promotions where you can even get it for free. So I really recommend people to, uh, to, <clears throat> to explore the opportunities in the website. We also give awards for excellent PhD student award, excellent master student, even uh, young scientist career awards. So I think it's really great. And the conferences, as I mentioned, uh, include the, the top one in the world, which is IDM, but also many others. Uh, so I just wanted to make a little bit of publicity of this because it can be useful for many, uh, for many people. You also have some webinars uh, in the website that you can even access 
uh, to record their talks. So I think it's something that, um, yeah, as I mentioned, you can explore in the website and maybe if you are interested, you can register. And now let me just move to the talk. So um, just before I start, you're gonna see this title, Wafer Scale Integration of 2D Materials in High Density Membristic cross Matter Arrays for Artificial Neural Networks. I am an electronic engineer. I got my degree, my PhD in 2010, but I have been always doing materials. I have been doing uh, uh, conductive atomic force microscopy to explore the properties of the materials at the nanoscale. And I am right now in a material science and engineering uh, department, but we do a lot of device oriented and reliability oriented studies. And we, if you see our papers, you will see one special characteristic is we always make statistics. We don't present uh, one characteristic. We present many data from many devices. And, and now we are trying to face a transition in which we move towards uh, to the materials based solid state electronic circuits, which I think is the next step that industry is going to go. So we want to anticipate and try to explore this. And um, we are studying a crossbar arrays of membristos uh, for mainly one reason, which is it is very easy to fabricate. When you are dealing with 2D materials, <clears throat> fabricating one transistor is something very difficult that requires many um, many uh, lithographies. Uh, the, you need to care a lot about having low amount of defects in the channel and in the dielectric. Uh, and uh, with membristors, uh, the requirement for number of defects is more relaxed and the fabrication is very easy because you only require two lithographies. So I think uh, this is a very great advantage from the fabrication point of view. And this is why we are working on this. But we are also interested in other circuits uh, like logic gates and other things that we, we could fabricate. So this is the outline that I will follow. And I will start by presenting on uh, membristic artificial neural networks very little because I'm not an expert on artificial neural networks, but you may have here that uh, artificial intelligence is gonna change the way uh, in which we live. Uh, our societies completely can help to improve economy, wellness, and national security. This is even more obvious in Asia because we have uh, many um, applications already that are commercially available. So these artificial intelligence products are normally based in artificial neural networks. And basically these are mathematical models that can uh, provide one value in the output depending on one uh, set of data in the input. It can process and make some correlations between outputs and inputs. Uh, it has been already used uh, with software uh, to recognize uh, figure, uh, to recognize images, or to recognize some audio, and even some more complex uh, data processing have been already done. Normally, all, always uh, using von Neumann uh, architectures, uh, computing architectures, and uh, software, powerful software. Uh, however, uh, this is not the most ideal uh, way of computing the information. It will be better to have uh, parallel data processing so that we can avoid data transfer from memory to the CPU constantly. And then uh, people have started to think, uh, what is the hardware more, that is more suitable for artificial neural networks? And then companies like IBM have started to build some um, new hardware for artificial neural networks. So uh, the main uh, building block of one artificial neural network uh, is the uh, is the multilayer perceptron, and it's, it's, it looks something like this. It's, it's mathematically, is something that uh, has several inputs, and it gives one weight to each input, so it multiplies by one number, and there is a sum and one comparison, and based on this comparison, we can generate one uh, one uh, impulse, one response at the at the output this is a little bit inspired on biological model even if it's not exactly the same but this is uh, basically inspired how synapses can transfer 
some uh, spikes produced at the input you can transfer it and the output. So um, basically, this will be a very simple and simplified building block based on these several different types of artificial neural networks can be created. And so um, people have started to, to, as I mentioned, to build this kind of synapses and this kind of electronic neurons using traditional CMOS uh, uh, devices. For example, you can see here the schematic used by IBM in, the CIM in one electronic synapse uh, inside the true north chip. It looks something like this, has several field effect transistors just to build one synapse. So uh, this is something that it may not be uh, as ideal as it should. It could be implemented more easily with other type of devices. And this is what we are investigating now. Uh, some uh, people starting by the early words from Shim and Yu and Philip Wong uh, demonstrated that one can also implement electronic synapses using a membristor. Uh, because actually the functioning is very similar. The synapse uh, changes its electrical conductance when it receives an electrical spike in the pre-neuron and transmit it into the post neuron after some period of time. You can also do the same uh, with one membristor. One membristor is basically one, ver one metal insulator metal junction. We always use vertical uh, junctions because they can be, uh, they can be, uh, they have a higher integration density. You can put many in, in less space and also integrate three dimensional. So with this kind of membristors, you can implement both bipolar non-volatile resistive switching or a threshold type volatile resistive switching, which is actually what you need in both of these uh, synapses and neurons. So basically, uh, you can see some works that have already implemented this part uh, using, uh, using non-volatile bipolar resistive switching membristors. Uh, basically, uh, it, is, it consists on a crossbar array that looks like this, where you have some top electrodes and bottom electrodes separated by the resistive switching medium. And with this, you can, you can easily implement this, this operation. And the comparison is something that you can also do with one membristor. Uh, you can uh, have, for example, a threshold time membristor in which when you reach a specific voltage, it just reaches the the low resistive state. However, this state is not stable, it's not, it's volatile. And when we switch off the voltage, um, this, uh, this uh, state uh, recovers. Actually, one of the most uh, relevant works in the literature uh, comes from Professor um, Wang and Professor Yoshua Yang. So with, the, with this silver electrode. So basically the way in which we uh, tune the properties of these membristors is by selecting different materials for the composition. So here you can see another example from Professor Wang, uh, in which they built this crossbar array of uh, electronic synapses and neurons, and you can see uh, the structure of each type of device. So um, the main thing here is that uh, still in order to get uh, electrical characteristics that fit the requirements of synapses and neurons, we still need to do research at the material level uh, because we need to ensure that the synapses show multiple stable states, linear transition between, say, between them, and they can potentiate and depress, which means uh, increase and decrease the conductivity. And also for the neurons, we need to uh, be able to have this bipolar, uh, this, this digital switching between two states that should show very high nonlinearity and, and a very stable relaxation, which is also something important. And of course, both of them need to have a low power consumption, high yield, low variability, high endurance, and high integration density. So there is still a lot of work to do, despite we have already seen some very important prototypes. So what we are doing in my group is to use multilayer hexagonal boron nitride grown by chemical vapor deposition. Um, we have so far uh, received the materials from our collaborators in Stanford, Austin, and Shanghai. And also we buy from Graphene Supermarket. 
And we also get some exfoliated samples from NIMS uh, because we always want to compare with the perfect, perfect material without defects. And the CBD process is something that uh, many of you may be familiar, especially Professor Lee with this very nice recent nature paper. So basically you have some, you deposit some seeds and at the high temperature they can grow until they nucleate. Uh, and then you can have a continuous field that in many cases will have grain boundaries depending on how you make the treatment of the substrate and the growth. You can even get um, uh, single crystalline uh, material. Uh, however, this has been only achieved with monolayer. With multilayer, it's a little bit more difficult. We are, we are now working on this. The first thing that we do when we receive, when we receive the material is to analyze the quality with uh, Raman, with uh, XTS also. And then we build some test structures for electrical analysis. And we cover all the range of sizes. We cover from less than 10 nanometers square using the AFM tip. We can also put the AFM tip on a nanodot electrode, which is a little bit bigger. And then we can also fabricate devices. Uh, we started at the beginning with the shadow mask, so they were very big devices. And then later we did also lithography, for, um, optical lithography and electron beam lithography. And one of the things that we do is we use the semiconductor parameter analyzer to analyze the resistive switching, which is necessary because you can you have to do also pulse voltage stresses. This is also something important. And one characteristic of our work is that we connect this machine to the tip of the AFM, which is something that nobody does. We have a paper coming soon in small where we explain how we do this. And uh, this is very interesting because you can analyze uh, synaptic behaviors at the nanoscale with the tip of the AFM. So the fabrication process is something quite standard. It, and it's very easy, as I mentioned, which is the main advantage of, of membristors. We deposit the bottom electrode, the top, uh, the resistive switching medium, which is the, uh, the, the boron nitride, which we transfer by using the wet transfer process. And then we deposit the top electrode. What you see here is a cross point structure because there's one device. But if you, we do a cross bar, we have many devices together. So the first thing we do is to uh, try to understand the material itself. So we have here in this slide one summary of a comparison between exfoliated material and CVD material, uh, both for HVN. So you can see the exfoliated material is just little flakes. So you cannot uh, consider this for doing any wafer scale uh, circuit. But it is useful to understand the material. The material under the tip of the AFM shows to be very, very homogeneous. Uh, the current maps show very little fluctuations. And when we do sequences of RAM voltage stresses, the current versus voltage characteristics that we see show a very low dispersion and, and high uh, onset potential. So this is something interesting because actually there are many IV curves here, 250 different points, and they show similar characteristics. So it means it's very homogeneous. If we do the analysis with the, with the um, CBD grown material, we find immediately wrinkles. We have multi-layer islands. And this, uh, these um, morphologies make that these locations are more insulating. You can see for the same voltage applied to the whole image, we can see lines that are insulating and islands that are insulating. And we also can get some uh, locations that will be more conductive because they have some local defects, as I will explain later. So you can see here, if we do the same test in same thickness boron nitride, you can see now the dispersion of the data is much higher and many locations are more insulate, are more conductive, which means they there are defects there. So um, the next step, we try to understand these defects. So we analyze a sample that is just boron nitride grown on copper. So what you see here is polycrystalline boron nitride on polycrystalline copper. And what you see in the current map is that the defects, which show higher current, uh, concentrate at three locations. The first one is the boron nitride that is on the copper grain boundaries. The second one is the, bor the, the grain boundaries inside the polycrystalline boron nitride. And the third one are these little points inside the grains. 
inside the boron nitrate grain. So we not only have defects in the boron nitrate grain boundaries, but also inside the, the grains. So if we zoom in here in, inside one of these grains, this is what we can see. We see defects everywhere. There are many defects. And the inter-defect distance is around, if you make an average, you get less than 30 nanometer. But this is the defects that the AFM tip can detect. I will show you later that there are more. In any case, if we analyze the properties, electrical properties of one HVN location without defect and with defect, we can see something very interesting. Uh, for the same applied voltage, which is four volts, if we apply the four volts in one of these blue areas, the current that we see is zero, is the electrical noise of the tip of the AFM. However, if we put the tip inside one of these defects, uh, what you can see is uh, the current is much, is much larger and we see fluctuations of the current uh, between two stable levels. This, is, this type of signal is called random telegraph noise signal and uh, it shows that there are defects that are trapping and detrapping electrons. This is something already demonstrated by many scientists. Um, you can get more information about this in our recent Nature Electronics paper. I'm sorry, I didn't update the reference. Uh, so you can check more information about this there. And um, this was the comparison between the exfoliated and the CVD at the material level, at the nanoscale. So now I show you the difference at the device level. We fabricate two devices with similar thickness, six nanometer. And this is made by exfoliation. And here I show you by CVD. So we can have, it's the, it's the same device size. It's, everything is the same. Also uh, metal uh, gold electrodes in both cases. You can see for the exfoliator, the current is very small until six volts. And then I see the current starts to increase. For the CVD, I see, I confirm that there is boron nitrate here. You can see the wrinkles very well. And we, uh, for the CVD, we have many devices. That's the beauty of the CVD. We can make variability studies. So we plot many different devices. We can see, in this case, the initial current is already much bigger. Uh, and also, we, we reach the dielectric breakdown at voltages between 3 and 6 volts. So basically, this device shows much more leakage current, and it reaches the breakdown much faster. This is because we have this local spots, local defects in the HVM. Um, so then after we did this, um, we thought, okay, this material shows a lot of leakage current. So initially our first intention was to test the reliability of this material as a gate dielectric for field effect transistors. And we were very sad because this was a disaster. <laughs> the leakage current was very high. The breakdown voltage was very low. So basically, it didn't work. It was a disaster. Uh, you can see also in this structure, titanium boron nitrate copper. With the first experimental IV curve already shows huge leakage current, breakdown voltage even lower than before. So it was a disaster. But my student noticed that when she applies negative voltage, she recovers the initial high resistive state. Well, high, it's not that high resistive state, but the initial conductance. And, and that she could do this for several cycles. This was the first demonstration of this behavior. There was a, a paper before than ours coming from NUS, but, but they, they didn't really prove that this material was layer structure. So, so uh, in, in our case, we made the TEM and this was very well established that it was layered. So we did this for some cycles and because it was the first paper, we published this in advanced functional materials. So what is happening here, the resistive switching mechanism, in our opinion, is quite clear. This is a filamentary resistive switching because we see a very abrupt um, breakdown and basically we can recover it. So we are, happening, we are, we are doing something like this. We're having a, a filament that it is reasonably wide. Uh, this is why this filament is non-volatile. We need to apply an additional electrical stress to break it. And in that case, we narrow it until it 
breaks in one location, which can be here, can be here, can be here. It will depend on the electrons, okay? So it's a little bit like a lining. However, a lining is a volatile breakdown. What we are doing in this specific device is a non-volatile. We analyze uh, what is the resistive switching mechanism, and we found this is highly dependent on the metal that you use, which indicates there is metal penetration. Uh, we also see some structure modification in the TM images after the stress, but the, the convincing fact for us was the uh, cross-sectional uh, EDS and EEL uh, surveys. They indicate that before the stress, we see the material is clean. There is no much metal. The boron and nitrogen signals are symmetric and overlap. After the stress, we can see clearly that there is migration of boron towards one of the electrons and penetration of metal. Now the metal here is, is high. So basically this is made of metal because in one half new oxide, for example, you can make resistive switching by moving oxygen only. And what stays there is, type, is, is the transition metal. But uh, in one boron nitride, if you move just boron, what stays there is nitrogen. So it's not enough conductive to produce this and break down. So basically, we also demonstrated that this is related to the defects because the exfoliated samples don't show this behavior. The exfoliated samples show a very dramatic breakdown. And they don't show any recovery. So this is related to the presence of defects in the CVD material. And we have characterized, this is a, a compilation of TM images uh, in one device. And basically, we have detected different types of defects. We have thickness fluctuations. We have this kind of lattice distortions uh, that we detected before in the AFM, but now you can see they are much closer to each other. This, this uh, distance is around two nanometer. This is because the AFM tip cannot detect all because we need to apply a specific voltage. But in the TM, we see much higher density. So this is important because then you can make the devices smaller. If you always need one device, you need to consider one defect to make resistive switching, you need to consider they are in here. At the same time, you don't want this thing is already amorphous. You want that it is two layer uh, structure because this layer makes a confinement effect that, that this defect cannot propagate laterally. So this is important. We also have uh, particles, probably rest of PMMA, wrinkles, uh, gaps with the substrate, uh, twin boundaries, something like this. And we also have grain boundaries, but the grain boundaries our grains are big, are, let's say, at least five micrometers, and our devices will be lot smaller. So you cannot rely on this to, to do the uh, resistive switching. And also, actually, the grain boundary in one monolayer may be very thin, but in one multilayer, it's much wider. It's one grain boundary is not just few atoms. And we also have some regions that are perfectly layered. So among all these defects, the ones that produce the, the that, that, uh, reduce the, the reliability that increase the leakage current is this one, the, the defective area. And this one, as I mentioned, you cannot rely on it to make the rest of switching, but this one is where the filament will be formed because it has the, the lowest electrical strength. So um, after that, we fabricated small devices uh, with areas of 150 by 200 nanometer. Uh, well, in fact, we wanted to do 150 by 150, but it was accidentally, we got one, one side uh, bigger. And we could observe bipolar resistive switching. But if we decrease the current limitation, we also observe threshold. So we have a material that shows both behaviors, which is something that in transition metal oxides is much more difficult to get, even if it can be obtained using different electrodes. So actually, this is also one explanation about this. Um, that we can observe both behaviors. And actually, if we apply many cycles, we can observe a very progressive transition between one, uh, uh, between the volatile regime and the non-volatile regime. And we also observe the same using pulse voltage stresses. Uh, we observe the volatile regime, there's relaxation of this device uh, when, when the currents are not so high when the currents are around 50 micrograms, we can observe relaxation. When we, uh, and actually it's very stable, it's, it's quite stable. 
And this is probably why it was accepted in Nature Electronics for publication. But we can also observe this non-volatile regime. You can see that here the currents are around 600 microamps, and we don't observe one, uh, one relaxation. Even if we stop 10 seconds, we don't observe this recovers to the initial state, which is something that happened here. You see, here it recovers the initial state. Here it doesn't recover. It's always constant. So this is proving that this is vola non-volatile. And when we want to disrupt the filament here, what we need to do is to apply pulses with opposite polarity, and then we can reduce the conductance. And also in the bottom nitride, we observe that we can tune very well, very smoothly, the potentiation of this device by selecting different voltages or different uh, times uh, of the pulses. So this is something that was surprising for us because normally what you see is an erratic behavior. You see for some pulses, it goes up, some down, some up, down, and you get a general trend, but never a, such a smooth curve like we observe here. So this is something that we were quite happy to obtain. And then uh, this was all at the, the device level. And then we started to try to make a little bit more statistical analysis. So the first thing that we do it is to try to integrate this in, in wafers. So we fabricated crossbar arrays. We observe that we can get some wrinkles and uh, we try to optimize the performance. So because we want either volatile or, uh, or non-volatile, we can select the materials to optimize one of these behaviors. So here we select gold, boronitite gold, and we observe quite nice uh, non-volatile bipolar resistive switching that takes place at very low currents, which is something that was especially interesting. And um, actually the variability cycle to cycle and also device to device was very small. And also something very important is that um, we, uh, we managed to get um, very high yield. And the yield here was related to the thickness of the boron nitrate because we don't make the best transfer in the world. We, we, we make our transfer is, is our home, our method. And I believe companies and other groups can do it better than us. But there is something that is true. When we transfer monolayer, 95% of our devices are shorter because they have a pinhole or one crack and we don't get very high reliability. But just with the same method, we transfer multi-layer and most of our devices work well. Most of them show correct uh, dielectric breakdown uh, process and correct, um, correct resistive switching. So this is something that it is uh, very interesting and allows us to fabricate large crossbar arrays. We have now 100 by 100. We are studying this. Uh, we have also studied, this is a paper that we will be publishing soon, the relationship between the morphology and the variability. And we have observed that the presence of wrinkles, even the presence of PMMA, doesn't affect the variability. Because this is not a transistor where you have the current in plane. You have the current out of plane and is localized always across the most conductive regions. So these regions, as I showed before, they are more insulating. The filament will never be here, and this will not produce a very high change on the variability. We still have some higher variability than some other samples, but when we analyze the resistive switching, I mean, the variability is only in the forming. For the cycling, our variability is low, and actually it is compared, it is, I mean, the variability of all the parameters, the, the switching voltages and the state current. It is comparable to what has been um, reported in transition metal oxides. Actually, when I presented this in IMEC, people was quite surprised that we can achieve this comparable um, variability for the switching voltages and the, and the state currents. So we also can minimize the number of wrinkles in this crossbar array by making it smaller if we make the, the wires narrow. And this is related to the fact that when we increase the roughness of the substrate, the number of wrinkles is smaller because this can release the compressive strain. Here, the compressive strain in a flat substrate produces the wrinkle, but when we have a rough substrate, the compressive strain is, um, is released by adapting to the uh, substrate morphology. 
So um, because we had all this data and, and we, we tried to go into the direction of the, of the artificial learning networks, but for doing that, we need to demonstrate analog switching. And then we tried to, to perform a whole range from, from nanoamps to, to milliamps in which we measure the, the resistance and we try to uh, change it by applying sequences of pulses and we could reach it very clearly for all the, uh, for all the, um, the levels. And what we demonstrated is that each current level is stable over the time, as you can see in these IT curves that expand many cycles, many, many orders of magnitude. So this is something that we didn't expect and was very useful. I also have to say that the depression was a little bit more complex and this is why we didn't show it in the paper, but we are working on it. And then when I was in IDM, I showed these results to Professor Dimitri Strukov, and he was especially interested on the fact that we reach stable states at some nanoamps. So uh, he said this could be very interesting to emulate uh, artificial neural networks. And then he used our data to make a simulation uh, of one multilayer perceptron network, and he observed that he can achieve uh, very low, very fast learning and very low error for the for this artificial neural network. Uh, I am not an, a big expert on the simulation side. We are we are hiring a postdoc to help us now to try to do this, and we are collaborating with Professor Dimitri Strukov on this. But I think, according to him, this was quite interesting for him. Also, because the half select disturbance between cells in the cross array was quite low. And this is related to the fact that the device shows that the switching at low current. And finally, we also demonstrated one neuron using silver electrodes, which is the, the main finding from Professor Wang and Professor Joshua Yang. Uh, when, when we use silver electrodes in boron nitrate, it works especially well uh, because we can achieve stable threshold switching for super low currents down to one picoamp. So we tried to measure the energy for the switching and uh, it was for us not possible because we cannot apply pulse voltage stresses uh, that switch at these currents. The, 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 low, the noise level when you do pulse voltage stress is of some nanoamps, so we couldn't measure this. So what we did is the calculation of the energy in indirectly, which means we, we calculate the set uh, and the set voltage and the, and the current using the IV curves, but the switching time, we calculate it from the pulses. And uh, with this, this, this is assumption is, is valid because the time you need to switch from the high resistance state to some nano arms will be always higher than the time you need to switch from the high resistance state to pico arms. So this, this assumption is valid. And then we achieve super low uh, switching energies. This is the, sw the lowest switching energy ever reported for any member store. We also make a try to make some endurance tests. We achieve uh, stable switching for 80,000 cycles. Here is also, I also want to emphasize that the endurance plot needs to be measured in every cycle, not just few points per, uh, per decade because otherwise you cannot estimate the variability and you don't know if you are really switching. I'm writing a perspective paper for ACS Nano on this, uh, on the correct measurement of endurance. But you can see for our devices, we measure five different devices, 1,200 cycles for each device, and we don't get any single cycle of any device that doesn't switch properly. So this is something that it, it was the this was the most difficult plot of the whole paper, to be honest. So we also achieved this multi-level relaxation uh, at these levels, and it's, it was also uh, something uh, interesting for the working as a neuron. So finally, the conclusion main conclusion is that okay, HVN still C CBD grown. Uh, multi-layer HVN uh, still contains too many defects. Uh, Monolayer can be grown, as Professor Lee demonstrated, well, without defects, and it is a very reliable material, but multi-layer is still challenging. 
So we can still not use it as a gate dielectric. Um, the HVN shows resistive switching, which can be volatile and non-volatile. And we have managed to make large crossbar arrays in which we achieve high yield and low variability, which is the main problem of 2D materials based devices. When we use gold electrodes, we can make uh, membristic synapses for image recognition. And when we use silver electrodes, we can use, um, use it as threshold time membristors, as ne neurons. And we could also use this in the future for spiking neural networks also, which is something I'm very interested in. And in the next step, we are trying to, to, to integrate this in CMOS wafers containing field effect transistors. We are making now 1T1R cells with some um, uh, CMOS transistors fabricated by companies. So I have my student, uh, Chu Kai Chen, is working on this. So I hope he can come soon to Kaos and use the electron beam lithography here to try to get more data. And finally, if you would like to know more about our work, you can check our uh, recent papers. On boron nitride, we also have this recent perspective nature electronics and uh, the recent um, paper on the artificial neural network is this one. Uh, and also the first paper uh, on, on boron nitride um, membristors uh, was the one in advanced functional materials, this one, and also this one. Uh, for synapses. And I think that's everything. So thank you very much for your time. And I will be happy to take any question if you have. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mario. That's a very inspiring talk. So uh, anyone has any question, please feel free to ask. Just turn, yeah, just unmute and then you can ask. Hi, Perplanza. This is Zhong Rei. Thank you very much for the very wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, like the threshold switching voltage and the thickness of the um, boron nitride. I'm wondering if there is any correlation between the uh, switching voltage and the thickness of the uh, 2D dielectric material? Yes, I believe yes. I believe there is a correlation because uh, switching voltage for the threshold devices is something that is related to the, I mean, it's, a, it's like a dielectric breakdown process. It's a soft dielectric breakdown, but this is still a dielectric breakdown. This depends on the boron nitride thickness. Uh, and we have seen it, but the problem is that, you know, because we get the samples, uh, now at Kaos, I expect to grow the material by myself, but so far we got the samples. So when you buy the sample from graphene supermarket, you get only one thickness, which is uh, six nanometers. Even if they advertise 13, it's not 13, it's, it's, it's six. You do, with the, you do cross-sectional TM or AFM, you see it's six. Um, so the way we tune the switching voltage is by changing the material and the size of the device, because we cannot change the, the voltage. Sometimes we found some devices where the boron nitrate is folded, and then you see much higher but it's not uh, that uh, thing. Um, for the samples from Eric Pop group, it's thinner. So we see in that sample, it, it switches at low voltage, but because it's not the same source, um, we cannot compare. Uh, I prefer not to compare. Uh, so, but yes, I agree with you that uh, thinner device will, um, thinner device, uh, thinner boron nitrate will result in a lower, uh, Switching voltage. I, I agree with. You. Thanks, Prof. Lanza for uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I I get, uh, I'm wondering like uh, uh, I have a follow up question. Uh, yeah, I quite agree with you that the thinner the uh dielectric thickness, the lower the uh, uh switch energy consumption, and uh, uh in I'm wondering like in case if there are just a single atomic layer of boron nitride, will, will that be sufficient to uh, to uh, make it in, make the device insulating in its resting state? That is a very good question. And I will say even controversial question because you have, if you have seen the papers from Professor Deji Akimbande in advanced materials and in nanoletter, and one recent in nature electronics, uh, he mentions about the atom restore in which he layer boron nitride monolayer 
uh, TMDs. And he achieved threshold time switching. Uh, I know some people in Tsinghua has tried to do this and they didn't manage to succeed. I have tried it in my lab and I have managed to succeed. I repeat, I reproduce the data from Professor Akin Bande, but my yield is very low. Okay, it, it, very few devices work. And I think it's reasonable because you may have pinholes. So maybe his boron, I, I assume that his boron nitrate is better than our monolayer boron nitrate and that his transfer process is also better. And I, I think he has managed to uh, get this and I fully trust uh, his work. Uh, I know it's very difficult what he does, but I think it can be done. And it will be very interesting to try to observe if this can be reproduced also with the single crystalline boron nitride from Professor Lee. I think that would be uh, amazing because that has much more chances to have a very high uh, yield because I know the boron nitride from Professor Akimbande is not a single crystalline at the wafer scale. So it is a very interesting future research line in that sense, I think. Thanks, Professor. Yeah, this this uh, these are very informative. I'm also wondering, like uh, regarding the uh, one transistor, one memory star array, would it be possible to make the transistor also a two D material based transistor? In that case, I'm wondering, can everything? Oh be yes, done? yes, yes, yes. This has been done uh, by Professor Philip Wong and his former postdoc, Professor Yang Rui. He is now in in this Michigan Shanghai Chao Tong University in Shanghai. Uh, they have a paper in Nature Electronics where they did this. Ah, no, sorry. In that paper, they use half new oxide membristor, I think. But we have a paper with Philip Wong in IEDM where we use molybdenum disulfide uh, transistor and HVN membristor. And there is a recent paper in Nature Communications from Wu Huaqian where he also does uh, to the material based fill effect transistor plus one uh, half new oxide, I think, membristor. So one T1R using the transistor with molybdenum disulfide has been done. I believe the paper we have with Philip Wong is one of the few where you have both with 2D material. Oh, that's really cool. I see. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, very impressive uh, research. I think so. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Mario, I have a, a fundamental question. So I understand that actually you believe that the lattice distortion side, it can be correlated to the filament formation. Uh, that is from what I understand from your talk. And uh, you also believe that this is purely due to the physical penetration of metal, right? Then you have a switching behavior. So do you think whether there's any uh, electronic state change uh, in that local area? So, so my, my, uh, the reason I ask is that if it is a, a physical penetration of metal, probably it could be quite difficult to have a control in the future for large area. But if it involves in the uh, electronic state change, uh, that you may have a chance to have a better control uh, in, in terms of large scale electronics. So what is your point? What, what is, your, is your viewpoint for, for, for my comments? Yes, actually, that is a very good point because this measurement that I have shown, showing the, there is a, there is a big dependence on the metal that you use, that is for sure. So the metal is doing something. Uh, this, this, this analysis is, is super complex because first of all, it's not in situ. So you don't know if you are analyzing the, the point that you are, uh, that, that did, did the breakdown. Uh, analyze many places and we collect like this my student collected around 40 plots like this and then you need to evaluate what is the most repetitive thing because all of them are different <laughs> so the most reproducible chemical rearrangement we observe is movement of boron that always happens uh, this is the the, the chemical species uh, the chemical uh, um, rearrangement that has the lowest activation energy. And we have also confirmed by, by simulations. In, we are publishing a paper in advanced materials probably in two weeks where we do some simulations. But I have to say around 
60%, I mean, the, the bottom movement is in 90% of the images. Around 60% of the images also show metal penetration. So that, that is the fact. Uh, the, the, everything that comes later is a speculation. So uh, the fact is, is this uh, reproducibility? What I think is that there are both, especially in multi-layer. However, I think in monolayer, it could be possible you don't have any metal penetration. However, there is something that now we are working, but people didn't work with it. If you, will, if you want to know this, you need to use platinum electrodes because gold electrodes, co uh, copper electrodes, or any other electrode will move. So we are now doing all our manristor, we have, we have changed, and my students right now are only putting platinum uh, to do this test. If you see the first paper in Nature in 2008 about the first membristor, they use uh, uh, that was from HP, from, from Stanley Williams and Dimitri Strukov. They use platinum, titanium oxide platinum, and they are sure that is because of movement of oxygen, because the platinum will not move. So we have changed. Now we are only using platinum, and we hope that clarifies a little bit more because we don't expect platinum to move at all. Right, I see. Yeah, please allow me to ask another question because you are at this page, right? So if we look at these two, uh, uh, the graph, so you see uh, the difference between fresh and stress devices. But uh, when you do the stressing, of course, they, they may be, uh, they may be a chance that the uh, structure of the materials reconstruct and then they become other things. So what really matter is that for the stress device, did you measure the uh, uh, high resistance state and low resistance state? What are the difference in, in terms of the uh, seams profile? Uh, I'm just wondering whether the boron can penetrate back or it's already fixed. And maybe the electronic state change, uh, I would say the resistance state change is caused by other factor. So do you get uh, I understand. I understand, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the thing is, uh, because we are using, uh, uh, I mean, when we are doing the resistive switching, um, once you make the filament, once you make the forming, um, what you what you are gonna get is something that is not layer anymore. The, the, what you are gonna have there, at least in multi layer, is not layer anymore. So you're gonna have a mix of materials there uh, that can switch, but uh, it is not uh, layer anymore. So um, the the point is that this material that we use was thin. Uh, it was less than six nanometers, and uh, getting a difference between the um, fresh device and low resistive state device was possible. Getting a difference between the high resistive state and low resistive state, the difference was too small and we didn't get any conclusive result. I know that the paper from Professor Miao Feng in Nanjing, he used exfoliated much thicker and he was able to see a difference. And also we are now trying to make some tests with exfoliated. So I think uh, um, it could be possible, but only with thicker materials, because if you analyze something very thin, uh, well, I don't know if the T, I mean, cows can detect, but, but it's very difficult. Uh, the, the, there might be a chance that thicker sample is different and behaving different from thin sample. There may be another chance because uh, I'm still wondering whether there's any electronic state change, which is something we want to look for because it has better controllability in the future, right? Rather than uh, the cross part diffusion uh, that, that's difficult to control. Anyway, that, that's my comment. Uh, a low know, currents, a, a low currents, I'm sure, because a low currents, we see this. Okay. And the telegraph plot, the random telegraph noise signal, it is an electronic state. So we, we know this can happen, yeah. but low currents, at high currents, probably everything mixed together. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, any other questions from audience? Please. Hi, Professor Lanza. Hello. Hi, uh, Professor Lanza. Uh, this is a candy from Hong Kong U. I have a question about the uh, array measurement. And looks, uh, it's very impressive to see that you have achieved a very high device yield, even if this uh, uh, devices are uh, fabricated in array. But it's, it seems to me that most of the devices uh, you have uh, fabricated is without the transistor as a selector. So I'm wondering uh, when you measure this device, especially the yield or like a, a device to device variation, uh, how do you make sure that there's no device to device disturbance in 
Or... Yes, um, it depends on the it depends on the um, on the current range that you operate. So okay. we can operate at different current ranges. You can see it in this slide. Uh, what we did is to simulate it. Dimitri Strukov simulated cell to cell disturbance, and he observed that if we consider the blue plots here, we consider these current ranges. He calculated that the cell to cell disturbance is uh, low. Uh, however, uh, I'm not an expert on this type of calculation. You may find more details of how did manage to do it uh, in the paper. Um, actually, uh, when you combine simulations and experimental results, normally there is a little barrier where the experimentals don't understand the simulation 100%. And, uh, and the guys who do the simulation also don't have a lot of uh, uh, deep understanding on the measurement, but we put it together. So, so yes, I think uh, I, I cannot fully understand 100% the simulation, but I believe uh, it was done by one of his postdocs. Uh, he, uh, he was... And I believe if you want to know more about the simulation, you can also send him an email. Um, but in the paper, it's described quite well, also in the supplementary information. Mm -hmm. oh, very, very cool. And also, and also you, are, you are also working on the uh, arrays with, with transistor. Um, could you provide more insight from you that uh, how do you compare between the transistor legs, uh, the array with transistor and the array without transistor. And uh, transistor. Yeah, for the transistor, we are really uh, we are really in a very early stage. We just got some measurements last week from Chu Kai Chen, and he he got really nice uh, uh, results, even better than in the paper we published in IDM. Uh, however, our transistor is CMOS transistors. The paper in IDM is a two D material based transistor. So we, we are starting. Uh, the crossbar arrays that I show here, uh, these crossbar arrays are one T1R crossbar arrays. Uh, they have been these wafers have been provided by our collaborator. So we are we are going to try to study this, but so far uh, we are we are starting. But this is a very interesting point, and if if you really want to know more about this, we can also discuss because we will need help to uh, interpret all the data that we get and, and redesign our electrical test. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your impressive presentation. Thank you. We still have a few minutes. Uh, question? Okay, so if not, I can ask a very short question. Uh, it's a, a general view for the topic. So uh, what do you think the advantage of using HBN uh, uh, as a switching materials compared with other like oxide, using oxide? What, what is the, your global view for this? What, what yeah. is the reason to use to the materials for the purpose? My, my idea is, and we are uh, in this paper that will come soon in, in advanced uh, materials, we demonstrate one behavior that it is very interesting. In my opinion, the mo one of the most interesting reasons is the confinement effect. It's the first time you have a material with two very different properties. This material here has properties extremely different to this material here. You know, so this layer, uh, the material makes a kind of confinement effect that you don't have in any other material. Well, you have also in polycrystalline to the material, in polycrystalline half new oxide, for example. But in this case, uh, I think the size of the grains and the type of grain boundaries is less controllable than in 2D material. So I think uh, and this is something that we should exploit. And we have used this to make um, highly stable random telegraph noise signals, like the one that I showed before, uh, like this one. Yeah, like this one here. And these signals can be used to produce true random number generators for advanced data encryption. So we have a paper coming that is about the use of 2D materials for 
uh, data encryption using uh, through random number generators. So I think uh, that is the main the main reason why using this material. However, of course, if we can manage to grow this, like you did for monolayer, but if we manage to do it for multi-layer, uh, that will be awesome. So we, we are trying in my lab uh, here at Chaos once uh, we get the CBD systems to try to do this with multi-layer. So we are starting your work a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So I think it's about time to close the session, but I really acknowledge that you, you, you spent a lot of effort in making this uh, wonderful lecture happen. So, and also we, I hope that you can come to Hong Kong, visit Hong Kong again to interact with a uh, uh, faculty member in different university in Hong Kong and do more collaboration with us. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I also wish, I, I love Hong Kong. I, I wish to go <laughs> as soon as the yeah. pandemic yeah. ends. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. We need to do collaboration. Thank you. And of course, you are all welcome to come here anytime. <laughs> yeah. Nice okay. place. Thank you.